Welcome everyone to Masterminds and Maintenance, a podcast for those with new ideas and maintenance. I'm your host, I'm Ryan. I'm the CEO and founder of Upkeep. Each week I'll meet, be meeting with a guest who's had an idea for how to shake things up in the maintenance and reliability industry. Sometimes the idea failed, sometimes it made their business more successful, and other times their idea revolutionized an entire industry. Today, I'm excited to welcome Ricky Smith, maintenance and reliability best practices advisor to the show. I love reading Ricky's thoughtful responses to maintenance and reliability questions on LinkedIn and really appreciate the active role that you've taken on to acknowledge um, you know, all of the experts in this space. Welcome, Ricky, to our show. Hey, thank you very much for having me. Of course, of course. Really, really excited about having you on our show. Again, what I talked about is, you know, trying to, trying to build um, better practices within the industry and get thought leaders like yourself to really preach the word of, of reliability and maintenance. Um, so first, I, I kind of wanted to check in. I know that you're over there on the East Coast. How's it going over there with the Hurricane Dorian? Well, the hurricane where I'm at, it just took away all the moisture in the air. So it was just bright, sunny shot skies. But along the coast where my mother lives, it, they get hit pretty hard, but not not as bad as some past hurricanes. So everything's okay. Okay. Well, I'm Sounds glad to hear. It really is. All right. Well, I'm glad to hear that everything's, you know, all right for you, your family as, as well. Um Let's go ahead. I would love to learn more a little bit about yourself and maybe you could kick things off by sharing a little bit about yourself um, and how you got started in this industry, Ricky. Okay. Well, started in the industry, went in the U.S. Army and wanted to go to school to be a heavy equipment mechanic. So I went to school, learned how to rebuild about everything the U.S. Army had. Then uh, when I got out of the Army, I worked with civilians for a while Then ultimately got transferred to a unit in Germany, worked on tanks mainly. But uh, what I found was maintenance was maintenance. The fundamentals is there. Once I got out of the Army, I went to work for a small company called Exxon at a refinery. You know, my dad worked there, you know. So. Small company, right? <laughs> yeah, small company. It was easy to shoe in to get in the refinery because if you don't know somebody, you don't go to work there. You know, so I got in and I learned a lot. I learned a lot there. I mean, he's the closest person to me and seniority who had been there 30 years. Wow. So a very senior organization. It taught me how to follow procedures, how to do things to specifications. And uh, so it kind of set the foundation. Now, unfortunately, I was the first person to leave Exxon in maintenance ever, you know, except unless I guess maybe if something happened to you outside work, but, but I was the first person to leave. I went to work for a company called Alumax Mount Holly and it ultimately became Alcoa Mount Holly, the world-class maintenance model. And that's where I learned really strategies, you know, around how to plan, schedule, how to, how to execute work, the specification. And while I was there as a technician, I also worked as a, I became a maintenance engineer and technician. So I worked for the maintenance engineer we had, and that really advanced me as far as root cause analysis and identifying failures and how to mitigate them and all. But that set the foundation for my whole life. And Throughout life, it's been, I've been a, been a maintenance supervisor, maintenance manager. I was a company commander in Iraq for a maintenance company, not because that's my maintenance background as an officer. It was not. But so happens I worked for a one-star general, and he said, hey, I just relieved the company commander from a maintenance company going to Iraq. I understand you know that maintenance stuff. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. He said, see you in 365 days. So maintenance is maintenance. Doesn't matter where you go. <laughs> I love it. That's such an awesome story, Ricky. Um, so I, I'm also curious, you know, what's changed since you first got started in this industry? You know, a lot, there hasn't been a lot to change it's, it's, except with technology. You know, CMMS, we had the first fully integrated CMMS in the world when I went to work at Alcoa or Alumax Mount Holly. So people didn't understand software and how do you have to input data and how do you, if you didn't put data in, you didn't get the right data out or corrupt data in, corrupt data out. And I guess that set the foundation for a lot of things with me and making sure that the CMMS, no matter how you know simple it is or how advanced, and I have to tell you, in most companies, and I'd say, I'd say 90% plus, they don't fully utilize their maintenance software. Whether yeah. they use an SAP or Oracle or whatever it is, they don't fully use the capability of it. Yeah, absolutely. Where do you see people not using a CMS to its fullest capabilities most commonly? 
most simple one, they don't put all work into work history. All so right. They, they, don't, they don't capture all events, all activities on work orders charged to the right asset. That's the big problem. Yeah. So the, we want a blanket work order. Yeah. But a blanket work order doesn't tell me anything where my failures are, which ones are recurring, are they tied to, to other equipment, and so on. So it's, it's crazy. Absolutely. So, so this data quality piece is so, so important for being able to drive decisions. You know, Ricky, I, I've read your book, um, Rules of Thumb, and you, you commonly referred to Mount Holly as kind of the world-class standard for maintenance reliability. What was that journey like of getting, you know, that facility to world-class standards? Because I imagine it was, a, it was a long journey, right? It didn't just happen overnight. No, no it wasn't a long journey. <laughs> it was a new facility. The engineer and the maintenance manager came from Lyco, Lycoming, and, uh, which was a helicopter um, engine company. He was a QA engineer, charged with acute quality assurance of helicopters. So he took that philosophy, and what he did was brought smart people in to design, plan, and scheduling, you know, work execution, all the things that need to get the desired outcome. Like he said, he thinks of a helicopter. It's got to go up and down in a controlled state. He expects a billion dollar aluminum smelter to produce what it's supposed to produce at the cost it's supposed to produce it at. And that's what we did. Wow. So he brought experts in. I was not one of them that had that, you know, what the depth of knowledge at that time to understand it. But the fully integrated maintenance software we had, condition of employment was all work had to be in the CMMS. Condition uh -huh. of employment. And some of the people didn't make it. Some of the people got terminated because of that. So when you close out a work order, your data had to be accurate, had yeah. to be correct. Wow. So what I'm hearing is like the, the data quality was kind of the fundamentals of being able to, you know, make improvements onto the business and get you guys to this world-class standard. Absolutely. You know, and people have tried to duplicate this, you know, I mean, some large corporations came in and paid a lot of money to, this plant to, to learn their model and none of them went back and did much. They may have spiked a little bit, but then they dropped off. Unfortunately, it's terrible you know, that it ha happens, but it requires discipline, it requires a process and it requires metrics to be able to manage it, leading and lagging metric. Yep, absolutely. So, you know, we talk about reliability, world-class standards, you know, I, I feel like you know, after talking to many, many people in the industry, everyone's kind of got their own little definition of what reliability is, whether, um, and it kind of depends on who you are, what industry you're in. So Ricky, wh what does reliability mean to you? And what does getting to world-class standards mean? Uh, reliability is really about meeting the functional requirements of the end user. And, and if it's an asset, the functional requirements of that asset. So if the asset is supposed to perform at a certain level, rate, speed, you know, function, whatever function that is, then reliability is be able to provide that. That's the reliability of the asset. Mm -hmm. It's like buying a new car. We don't want to buy a new car and it break down. So we want it reliable. But the same thing goes true. It is two types of reliability. There's asset reliability or the equipment side. And then there's process reliability. And if we don't have both stable and in a focused effort to keep us there, then we're not going to be fully successful. We, we may be successful, but not where we could be. Yeah, absolutely. And so I, I read a recent post of yours and we're talking about having reliability success. I imagine a lot of having success requires a lot of planning. Um, so your most recent post regarding maintenance planning, where do you see the biggest mistakes that people are making with regards to maintenance planning? Well, you know, I, I, it's, a, it's kind of a humorous conversation. I always bring up is that, you know, your reactive maintenance, if your maintenance planner is chasing parts every day for, for current jobs, because once the planner is, is for future work only, you know, future work only. If it's today's activities, it's the maintenance supervisor's responsibility to handle, not the planner. The planner, if you want to be successful, make sure you got a planner. Make sure that, that no one touches this person. I mean, it's, sometimes you have to talk to them. You know, sometimes that happens, but it'll be a rare occasion you go see the maintenance plan. It ought to be rare. Got it. So what I'm hearing is 
like having a separation of concerns, a separation of of people, roles, and responsibilities. Someone who thinks about the future versus someone who thinks about the today. Um, and, and what I hear is you're breaking it out between a maintenance supervisor handles the today activities and the maintenance planner um, handles the tomorrow activities and the future activities. The future, right. So the planner is strategic, the supervisor is tactical. That's Absolutely. the way I look at it. And so I can imagine a lot of people asking this question next is, when is it the right time to hire and separate these into two different roles? How do you know when it's the right time? Day one, you know, that's where you start. You got to start somewhere. I mean, yeah. if you're reactive, starting anywhere is going to get you somewhere. But a planner, you know, a lot of people want to go outside and hire a planner. I'm more taking the best maintenance technician that will sit up behind a desk, that can use a computer. I wanna make them a maintenance planner. I wanna have them formally trained, but when they're formally trained, send them somewhere to a company that's trained maintenance planners, but make sure you send the maintenance manager with that, that planner. Mm. So them two together can learn together, because otherwise people send planners off to training. I've trained a lot of them, and they, and they go back and it's like, you know, we're talking about maintenance planning and they don't even understand the real definition of maintenance planning and scheduling. I said, yeah, I told you to bring the guy with you. Yeah. <laughs> That's the only way it's going to work. You got to bring the boss with you. <laughs> or, yeah. take, or, or the other option is bring, bring the instructor back to the plant, to train the plant on planning and scheduling. Yeah. That's huge. So, so yeah. what I heard is getting buy-in from multiple stakeholders is really important, especially when you're thinking about separating these, the, this role. Um, so imagine, you know, we've got a, a brand new facility that's trying to take on reliability and, you know, basically saying, hey, we're going to take in a maintenance technician, turn them into the scheduler, the planner. Any tips, tricks, advice? that you give this new person coming into this new role um, to how to create, to think about how to create a, an effective maintenance plan? Right, I'm gonna take it, I'm gonna take a step even further back. Let me think about it. So you spend a billion dollars on a plant, you know, and you really don't have insurance on the reliability. You may have monetary insurance, but really what does your customers want? And that is they expect a certain quality output you know, on demand, and that's what we got to deliver. So in order to do that, we have, a, have to have a maintenance strategy, reliability strategy, that's going to protect that process and asset reliability. Because if we want to be the lowest cost producers, then we look at maintenance cost as a percentage of replacement and asset value, is that if reactive plants are extremely high, you know, up to upwards of 18%, and then where world-class plants are somewhere between 1.7 and 3.4%. That's a massive amount of, imagine the production losses when you're spending that much money on maintenance. Huge. You know, it's massive. It's massive. So if you want to, if you're going to build a new plant, you need an insurance policy and that's proactive maintenance, not just planning and scheduling, just total proactive maintenance. Yeah. So th this is a really good conversation into this next question here around, you know, KPIs. You know, we look at total replacement value um, and, and maintenance as a, as a function of that. What are the best KPIs to track as a maintenance reliability um, department, especially as we think about moving away from, you know, firefighting into more of a proactive role? That's a great question. You know, I, what I like is one is have a dashboard where everybody can see it, you know, up on the big screen when you walk in the plant, you know, it hits you right in the face. What's our maintenance data? What's it look like? And then in the maintenance shop, the break room, wherever I can see it, because I'm, I'm trying to change people's behavior. So some of the metrics I'd have in fall, start with, we're talking about preventive maintenance is where a lot of the work's going to come from. So preventive maintenance, what's our What's my percentage, my PM compliance, but also besides PM compliance, I like PM labor hours versus emergency labor hours. Mm. I like to trend it because it doesn't make sense if we perform and prevent a maintenance on equipment that continues to break down. That's called insanity. <laughs> <laughs> and then in, in planning percentage of plan work, SMRP, Society for Maintenance and Reliability Professionals, made up of members like myself, 
And that's why you see that CMRP at the end of my name. It's, it isn't about being certified. It's about being in a community where you can learn from some of the best practices. So in that, SMRP has created our, our membership. We've created metrics, definitions for those metrics for all of them for the school board and for a lot of things. So I'll give you an example, talking about a plant. So we got percentage of plan work. You know, we've got PM labor hours versus emergency labor hours, percentage of plan work, and it, there's a structure to that metric. Schedule compliance. I like it by day, by hour. Mm -hmm. Okay, some people do it by week, but that means you got reactivity. We can't do it today. We'll push it off tomorrow. We'll still get our, our, our compliance. It doesn't work that way in my world. Okay. And then when we do the, when we go forward with that work execution. So when we execute the work, do we have rework from that? Rework's a metric that says we perform maintenance on it, but we had to go back to it within a certain amount of time and had a problem with it again. And it's probably one or two things. It's either the same problem we didn't solve or we were trying to solve the wrong problem. And then get down to it. I want to know, you know, my work orders. What percentage of my work orders are closed out when all the codes identified? Because that once those codes go into the CMMS, you can't change it. I mean, you can go and manipulate it, you think, but you can't. It's, it's in there. It's solid. Yeah, absolutely. Um so you, we, we talked about some KPIs that are related to preventative maintenance, whether it's PM compliance, whether that's labor hours, um, whether that's, you know, what percentage of your jobs are proactive in nature. Um, I, I think the common thing that we've also seen, too, is shifting away from doing PMs just to say we finish the task. So I, I think the question there is like, how do we make sure that we're not just tracking work that's being done just to make it be done? How do we make sure that our PMs are effective? How about that? Yeah, well, that's, that's why I like PM labor hours versus emergency urgent labor hours. Got it. You track it and trend it. It's just logical. I did that as a maintenance supervisor and it shocked my maintenance technicians. They didn't like it. They didn't want to see it. And I said, it has nothing to do with you. It has to do with, we have a process problem. It's not a people problem. It's a process. We've got to get this process functional. And we did. And well, how long did it take? I don't know. I mean, until we really started making some serious gains for probably six months to eight months. But wow. we were focused on it every day. That's huge. And we, we often talk about creating a cultural shift. Any like advice there on how to create a cultural shift inside the entire company and within the department? All about the money. I mean, <laughs> there's, a, there's a big one. If you could, I mean, there are ways of doing it to calculate how much losses there are on a plant. You know, it has to be done formally, it has to be done in, in, a, in a state that management will accept it. And once you have those numbers and you look at, you, know, you quantify where the losses are being, you know, where they go to, because in most companies, I can tell you 99% of companies, most of your losses come from production, not maintenance. Mm. They blame it on maintenance, but it's really production cause losses. So looking at that is a big deal. How much are you losing money? And there's a numerous ways you can do it. Wible, you know, plotting, we use Wible for looking at, you know, process losses, but not monetary losses. We can yeah. use process Wible to do the same thing in our process, how we work, how much money are we losing? Mm-hmm. Got it. So it's, it's really centered around tracking KPIs and associating all of these things that we're doing to how it affects the value of the business and the entire production, production line, or whether that's, um, you know, the, the you know, dollars that, that we lose from process problems. Um, well, we I, got, I, you know, we got, re we got repeatable failures on similar equipment and we don't even know it because we don't track the information. Yeah. If you have a motor problem in one part of the plant, you probably got motor problems on everywhere in the plant. You just don't know it because it's not linked together. Yeah. You're just seeing a mess. Yep. So let's talk a little bit about common failures for assets and their failure patterns. Um, I, I read one of the statistics that you more, more recently published as well that, you know, 89% of failures are random. And only 11% of failures are age-related. Knowing that 89% of failures are random, what can we do as, you know, budding reliability leaders to get ahead of this problem? 
Well, first thing is making sure the equipment is kept in a maintainable condition. If it's not in a maintainable condition, then it doesn't do any good. Just, you know, we perf and what I call an insanity, performing preventive maintenance on equipment that continues to fail. So best thing to do is you have equipment that continues to fail, we'll perform preventive maintenance on it, put a big sticker on it, RTF, run to failure, we know that's our maintenance strategy. Okay. So but also how equipment is operated. You know, it has a lot to do with those human-induced failures, 89% right? of failures, you know, the, the, the random ones. Random ones, the best way to mitigate random, you know, to mitigate them is PM, to actually identify them, because some you can't identify far enough in advance, some you can, is, is using predictive maintenance and condition monitoring. That's a big mm. deal. A lot of people, this, I'd say 90% of companies, I'm, I'm given a generic number, but I tell you, it's, it's very true. 90% of companies use PDM only for insurance reasons. So okay. once a year or every six months, someone comes in and does some vibration, or does some infrared, and they're gone. That's not the way it works. Asset needs Your assets need to be identified based on criticality and defect severity. And once you do that, then you go through that ranking and then determine which assets do I want to put PDM on and what interval. It always goes down to the lowest common denominator, like an electric motor, what fails first on electric motor? Bearings. So if bearings fail first, and we get an indication and bearings fail randomly. SKF has proven that on all the studies. You know, so when someone does vibration analysis and says, hey, we got a bearing fault on this outboard bearing on this 50 horsepower motor, you know, first thing they ask is, how long do you think it'll run? I mean, I got no magic wand. They sold out of those a long time ago. <laughs> I'd say what you need to do is you need to go ahead and plan it. You may not schedule it now because you can't interrupt production. Plan it. Have a have a new motor waiting. You're ready to ready to go or rebuild shop ready to go whenever that is the weekend or whatever. And we go in and replace it. And yes, it is still running, <laughs> but it will fail randomly. I promise you. And it's not at the right time either. It's never at the right time, huh? <laughs> never the right time. Yeah. So I also read, you know, ninety-five percent of equipment from that study will benefit. You mentioned ninety-five percent uh, would benefit from some sort of condition monitoring, and that only six percent benefit from some sort of time-based replacement or overhaul. Um, do you think companies are relying too much on time-based replacement, time-based preventative maintenance? But when you get into like oil refineries and all, I mean, sometimes, you know, a lot of the data comes from them. And when they have an outage, you have to, you have to look at everything that could possibly fail and change it out, especially based on criticality. So if the, if the criticality of that asset is extremely high and the risk to the business is high, then we're probably going to re rebuild it, replace it. But in normal companies, no, you, you don't, you don't have that. Yeah. You know? So it's, it's a different, depending on what market, you're looking at and so some of the data comes from oil and gas and mining and, and everybody's a little bit different. Sure, absolutely. Um, so kind of pivoting a little bit, what do you see some of the biggest mistakes that, that people often make in the maintenance reliability space, especially for new up and coming reliability leaders? Well, one, they don't have procedures. Okay. People don't have repeatable procedures. That's a big one, so up and coming. I mean, that's, that's a big one. I would, I would definitely start writing procedure. In fact, I'd say in the last three years, 100% of the plants I've been in don't have repeatable procedures. They thought they did, but when we really detail it out, it's not. So the worst thing that can happen if you have a failure, you pull out the procedure and say, what went wrong? And, and you don't do it by, by chastising someone. You have the technicians that work on it. Say, guys, you see any difference in the procedure? Oh, yeah, man. I, I missed the step. Okay. This one's on me. Next one's on you. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you got to change that culture, but you can't use a hammer to do it. You got to do it, you know, slowly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, again, like going, going towards uh, the, the new reliability, reliability leaders, what resources do you find yourself, you know, leaning towards to learn more about the industry and hone your skills and your knowledge? Where do you go for, for new ideas and thoughts in, the, in this industry? Well, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, the best, I'd tell you 100%, SMRP conference, you know, whether it's a symposium conference, I tell you, it's no smoke and mirrors. 
you know, the people that are speaking there firsthand, this is what I did. Be prepared. If you come, have a list of issues you have in your plant and look for those ahead of time so you, so you got it mapped out which session you want to go to and then what the expectations are when you come back. And you may even, if there's a consultant there and say, you know, I like what he said, you may want to say, can I bring you back with me? When can you come see me? Because there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it works well. Other conferences I like, International Maintenance Conference, you know, and I tell you, that's an awesome conference. What I like to do there is go there and breakfast in the morning, you know, and you meet one person there that looks really like glum, like, oh my God. Not they drank too much, it's just they're bummed out about what they're hearing. <laughs> and I ask them, so how's things going? They're going good, you know. Uh, you know, I said, how do you think the conference is going? I've learned a lot. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> I Makes just don't know realize, how to put it in yeah. action. I said, okay, this is the way I look at it. Just pick one or two things that you've learned and take it back with you. One or two things. Like I say, the guy that was speaking in that session, buy him a beer that night or you know, buy him dinner or something and get their ideas. And that way you can take it back with you. Never go to a conference without bringing some action items back. Don't ever do that. It's a waste of your time and a waste of the company's money. That's huge. I genuinely believe that too, Ricky. Um, and, and I believe the SMRP is next month in October. Is that right? Yes, it is. Yes, it All is. Right. Very cool. So, you know, are you going to be at the SMRP, Ricky? Where can our listeners go to, to contact you and find you? Uh, best way to contact me is, is on LinkedIn or yeah, LinkedIn is the easiest way. Ricky Smith, CMRP. So it's a certified maintenance and reliability professional. So that's what I use, Ricky Smith, CMRP. Or you can go on Twitter, follow me on Twitter. Facebook, I have a, um, I have a Facebook page, worldclassmaintenance.org, you know, on Facebook page. So they can look that up too. So plenty of places to find me. And I, I share a lot of information with a lot of people. So I'm not, I'm not bashful of giving information out. All right. Well, All I ask is you do something with it. Okay. Amazing. If I give you something, do something with it. Exactly. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ricky. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for joining us on this show. And thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in to today's maintenance or masterminds and maintenance.